Mrs. Walters, members of the St. Anne Parish Council, representatives of all the various agencies that have collaborated and will continue to collaborate in this project. The National Heritage Trust, the Trace Fund, the Ministry of Local Government, the St. Anne Parish Council. Let me acknowledge and, and honor you all. What we are doing today is symbolic because it's being done in the middle of National Heritage Week. But this doesn't even need National Heritage Week to embellish it. It's something that would be important to do at any time, in any month, in any week. It is something that perhaps bearing in mind that we are on the eve of celebrating 50 years of independence. It is something that one could argue should have been done a long time ago. We're doing it today. And one of the reasons why I took such an interest in it is because I was embarrassed every time I heard somebody mention how Margot Darby old house it, it, it must stay right. There are countries all over the world that make a shrine of the birthplace or the home of their heroes. We have done so too, because we created a shrine at Roxborough in Manchester, where Norman Manley was born. We created a shrine at Blenheim in Hanover, where Alexander Bustamante was born. And therefore, why not Marcus Garvey? And even though history has not confirmed that this is where he was born. History has affirmed that he spent his most formative years, those years when no doubt his creativity and his mind took shape, that took place right, right here. Shaheeni Robinson is fortunate. I don't know whether she had anything to do with it, but she's fortunate that even though there have been boundary changes, all of those areas that we have associated to research with Garvey, Davis Town, Roaring River, Higgin Town, St. Anne's Bay Priory, still seem to be squarely located within Northeast. That. And therefore she has a particular responsibility in preserving, enhancing, strengthening his legacy. We had some challenge because, and in fairness to the people who reside here, they have cooperated. They were never hostile to the project. They naturally wanted to be assured that they were not going to be simply abandoned and neglected. But we had to move in a particular way because involved in this piece of property are issues to do with entitlement, with titling, with estate, with beneficiary ownership. And when I was briefed as to the nature of those issues, it seemed to me that it may take a long time for those issues to be resolved for the people who can rightfully claim to be the heirs and successors to have that validated through the court. And we were not prepared to wait that long before we did something that we should have done a long time ago. But we have approached it in a way that is so respectful of their own rights. Not only are we going to, and we have made provision for their proper relocation, but in accordance with the law, if we can't wait for these things to be sorted out and if we have to acquire the land compulsorily as we have had to do in this case, the law requires that before we can set foot on the land, we must lodge 
in the bank and submit to the court the money that is the estimated tax of the land. So that once the issues are resolved, whoever is entitled to compensation will be properly compensated. And the amount that will be provided by compensation will eventually be determined by the court. So what we have done is to deposit what is based on the valuations that were done. But when the court adjudicates, if the court feels that it should be more money, then more money will have to be provided. We can't wait on that as well to assure these persons who have occupied this, this, this property, to assure them of the security of tenure that they need. And therefore we're going to proceed uh, to make arrangements. And if I know Shaheeni Robinson the way I know her, until it is done and done properly, she's going to be like a pitchery in you know what back. So I don't think that the people need to be uh, worried any at all. Let me say two other things before I close and I ask you to forgive me. I have to leave the island this afternoon and I'll have to rush back to Kingston. Why? What is so special about Marcus Garvey? Well, one could argue that it, what is so special about him is that he's our first national hero. He was declared before all the other six were declared. But that would not in and of itself be so powerful. A, 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 a factor that in a sense separates Marcus Garvey from the rest of our heroes. Marcus Garvey is in a place and a class by himself. Because there is no other hero that we have whose work, whose life, whose legacy has had such a profound impact far beyond our shores. And whose work, whose philosophy continues to endure. When Marcus Garvey in the 1920s and 30s, when Marcus Garvey ignited the consciousness of black people, he was not just talking to the people in Jamaica. He wasn't talking just to the people who he would meet so regularly at Liberty Hall. He wasn't talking just to the thousands that would gather at Idlewise Park to hear it. He was talking to the world and the world started to listen. And his downfall, what caused Marcus Garvey to be subject to the kind of persecution that he was exposed to, is because the world, and remember, you know, this is not after black power. This is not after Martin Luther King. This is back in the 20s and 30s. When the powers of the world at that time saw that the world was listening to this little black man from Jamaica. Then he had to be quieted. He had to be put down. He had to be pushed back. He had to be suppressed. And there are so many parts of the world that you go today. And the philosophy of Marcus Garvey is not just alive, but it is informing the way people live and the way people relate to each other. We in Jamaica perhaps have not done as much as we need to do to propagate, to evangelize the philosophy of Marcus Garvey. There have been calls, for example, for it to be taught in our schools. And that's something that I have supported. There have been suggestions that it should become part of our curriculum. Indeed, and in fact, it is taught in our schools, but not as a unique subject. It is part of the history that we need. And there are some challenges that have to be overcome. Because you have to design a curriculum in such a way that it has universal academic accessibility. And, you know, people will study Chinese history. And in the course of studying Chinese history, they will study the philosophies of Kong But we run into some academic challenges when we start to, in a, in a sense, personalize and personify academic person. It's done at, it's done at higher levels, don't get me wrong. It's done in terms of research-based studies. When people are doing their postgraduate degrees and their PhDs and so on, 
that's when they can go and specialize. But at our primary and our secondary level, it is difficult to get it identified as a subject so that when you ask somebody, well, which subjects you pass in school? And so, well, I pass maths and English and history and I pass Marcus Garvey. Much as we would love to see it promoted in that way, there are some institutional challenges that we face. But we can do much more. And we need to do much more to ensure that it is more prominent a part of this less delivery that takes place in our school. When you read Marcus Garvey, and I'm fortunate that I have a son who has done more research and knows more about Garvey than I will ever live to learn. But when you read Marcus Garvey, when you look at the issues that he sought to address, the way in which he analyzed those issues and the prescriptions that he offered, it is almost as if time has put this. Because those, those philosophies, those teachings, those prescriptions are as valid today as they were. 75 years ago, 80 years ago when he was when he was expressing that. And we have so much work to do to honor the legacy of Marcus Garvey. We have so much work to do to remove the dishonor that has been attached to Marcus Garvey and it's shown to Marcus Garvey sometimes in the way we live. There is an issue that has occupied quite a bit of discussion about getting a pardon for Marcus Garvey. We have tried in the past, Mr. Siaga made a passionate appeal to then President George Bush to issue a pardon and it was turned out. More recently, somebody in, in the states of Jamaica wrote and appeal to President Obama. The response didn't come from President Obama, but it came from a White House official that basically said they have more important things to No, They said that they can only focus in terms of giving pardon to those persons who are still alive. And there's no point in giving pardon to somebody who is no longer here to enjoy. I have I have somewhat different views about it. Nelson Mandela spent 27 years incarcerated in Robin Island. The punishment that he bore is not a stain on his reputation. It is the essence of the sacrifice that he made. It may be argued that Marcus Garvey's case is different. I don't think that at, at core it is really different because I believe that the charges for which he was convicted were to a great extent orchestrated, manipulated to silence a voice that was di disturbing the tranquility of the world of the 1920s and 1930s. And therefore some people have come to me to say, well, will you make a try to get America to pardon? And I've always hesitated because I said, when you're asking for pardon, you are acknowledging that you did something wrong. And therefore you want America to pardon you for doing something wrong. And I'm not one of those who were subscribed to any notion that Marcus Garvey did anything wrong. And therefore I, 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 I would like some support. I will hook up that conviction with Marcus Garvey. And I will say well, that is part of what we had to go through. So, to be the powerful symbol of black pride and black dignity and black consciousness and black potential that he was.
there's a second issue that relates to that, and it has to do with, well, what about our own criminal record? Because we weren't satisfied that America was persecuting him. We decided that we had to take a lick off of him. And therefore, we have him down as a criminal conviction here. I tried to pursue it some time ago, but I was told that those records cannot be found. So that even if you wanted to say, now, should we do something about that part of it, since we have the power? Technocrats are wonderful people, you know, but they spend a little, a little too much time advising me quite well intentionally why something can't be done rather than finding a way to do it. Um, and I was told that there are some legal, legal procedural issues that would prevent us from cleansing Marcus Garvey's record in our own country. And that's when I told them, well, I said, that is the problem. Then we are the ones who make the laws that us go to Parliament. And I still hope we didn't bring it to a point of this issue. I hope and Minister Granger wanted to pursue this for me. I hope that before we get to our 50th anniversary, that something is done in Parliament, some statute, some act is enacted to recognize that this man is not a criminal. This man is not a soldier. He's our, he's our first and most internationally famous and effective national leader. Today we're going to break ground. I have seen the preliminary designs of what it is that we seek to do and what we hope will be the outcome of our head. We're not coming here to build something out of our head. We have done a lot of research we have looked at the structure that is here. We have looked to see how that structure may have changed over time. We are trying to recreate it as best as we can based on the intelligence that we have of what it was when Marcus Mazar used to run up and down these steps. And when that time comes, I'm going to appeal. At that time, I will only come here as a visitor. And I'm going to appeal to everybody. Let us maintain it. Let us never allow it to look shabby. Because apart from being a shrine to which we will want to come and pay homage, it is going to be an attraction to tourists who are going to come here having heard about this man Marcus Garvey that one country, and who will come here and will be able, will be afforded the opportunity of going to see where this great man I said there were two things I wanted to come in. And the final one is this. There's something I hope to do almost in parallel with the restoration of Garvey's foiled home. And again, we ran into some roadblocks that I wasn't able to clear, but I, wa I, I want to urge that it be done. And it is this. Was it last There is a place on the road to Sligoville, a place called Pineta, which is where the late Leonard Howell lived. And part of our problem is that so many of us are strangers to our own history because there are so many people who don't know who Leonard Howell is. <laughs> Leonard Howell is the founder of the Rastafari <laughs> Yeah. And when I was told about the place, I set about, I asked him to help me, I said, let's go find out who owns it. I found out who owns it. It's a major developing company. They have built houses all around it. And we're probably planning to go 
build house there too. And I said, don't move one inch further, I want that place. And what I wanted to do was to, for government to acquire it, and for us to restore as best as we can from what research we would have been able to do, what Leonard Howell's compound looked like, because it was more than a house, it was a compound. Because that's an important part of our history too. Again, the Rasta movement is something that was created here, nurtured here, but has now become a worldwide phenomenon. There is virtually no country in the world that you can go and don't find Rasta there. And they may not be joined together in terms of an international network, but they represent a philosophy of life that started right here. People don't understand how powerful a little set of people we are in Jamaica. This is a country of 2.7 million people that produce a Marcus Garvey, a Bob Marley, produce Rasta. And it is something that we must, we must honor ourselves, we must recognize, you know, we tear down ourselves. So, we weren't able to complete it again because we ran into issues, controversies, even among the same brethren who we had hoped would sort of collaborate on this thing. So we weren't able to complete it, but I spoke with the owners. As a matter of fact, something that we didn't know, Minister Graves, and perhaps we need to pursue it. I believe we need to take steps to go ahead and compulsorily acquire the place. Because the last thing you want now is for them to go build three houses on the, on, on the land and virtually desecrate it. So let's acquire it and then let's talk to the rest of the brethren and see if we can straighten out how we develop it and how we restore it. But in the meanwhile, let us let us make sure that we we take ownership of it. Just as we have done here. Because with the greatest of respect, even to Garvey's legatees. Garvey. Garvey belongs to you and if anybody can claim that you know, he's a great grand nephew of Garvey. That's a powerful thing to put on your, on your CV. But the truth of the matter is that Garvey is... Garvey belongs not even to us in Jamaica alone. Garvey belongs to the world. And we are simply the custodians. The fortunate ones who can come and say, yes, see when we grew up there and see when we used to go to school there. And in the same, and it's the same thinking I have in relation to Leonard Howell. That's part of our heritage, where the rest of the movement was born. And I, I want to ask Minister Green to pursue it to make sure that we continue to work towards solidifying that as an important monument to the evolution of us as a people. We must do more. To honor the work of God. Teaching it in school is one thing. But we must not harass Marcus Garvey in his grave, which is what we do in so many respects. Marcus Garvey taught us to recognize that we have rights. The rights are not defined by the color of our skin. Indeed, and in fact, he said, look on your skin, you ought to be proud of it. Up you mighty race, he said. And I just wonder, what would he say to us now? When he sees so many of us completely uncomfortable with the skin that we are in. And we will... We are prepared to deny the baby the baby feed because we have to buy the bleaching cream. Bleaching cream from birth. I don't see no white people buying black polish to try and make themselves look black. I don't see no Chinese people that are so unhappy with their Chinese skin. 
that they have to find a way to look like some other race. Oh, no, and when do I stick? Yeah. 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 just destroy our inherent dignity. So, restoring the house is one thing. And that we're going to do. Trying to get Garvey's philosophy more integrated into our lesson program at school. That we can do and we're going to do some more work on that. But most importantly, let us start living as how Garvey would want us to live. Emancipating ourselves from mental slavery. And we have no excuse, none whatsoever, that 70 years after Marcus Garvey's death, it's almost as if for some of us he never lived. And we have never bothered to take seriously the teaching that he left us. The philosophy that he defined as a code of living that could make us so much a better people. I thank all the people who are here today to be part of this important exercise. Long live the teachings and the philosophy and the example and the symbol of Marcus Garvey.